from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A celebration of a dairy favorite. I'm Charles Denny, combining delicious ice cream and tradition. A visit to the new University of Tennessee Creamery. That story next on Ag Day. As we cover two big stories, including the World Dairy Expo and the latest on the Farm Bill. For dairy in particular, you know, we're not in a bad position. As basis slips up and down the Mississippi River. The Memphis basis for soybeans has just collapsed. The latest on what we're hearing when it comes to prices and policy, right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Turbulence in Washington is putting a new farm bill in jeopardy. Now, leaders say even getting an extension could be difficult. That comes from House Ag Chairman G.T. Thompson on Tuesday. Now, Thompson says because of current distractions, he's unsure a farm bill extension could make it through the House, and he expects attention to be fully on electing a new Speaker of the House. Work can continue at the staff level on, on the farm bill, but some key decisions still have to be made relative to funding and other issues, and of course the critical floor time. But now you also have the, the uh, you know complicating farm bill matters. Clinton is the uh, uh, the uh, November seventeenth uh, uh, you know deadline for funding the government uh, you know past that date for fiscal twenty twenty. Four, uh, there's a number of pretty good research firms who are saying their base analysis is that the government will shut down. Meanwhile, on the Senate side, Iowa's Chuck Grassley says a five-year farm bill is looking less likely and anticipates a one or two-year extension, even as Senate Ag Committee Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow vows to finish the legislation before retiring in December. I think if anyone can do it, she can, because she has a history of doing that. Plus, this will be a legacy item for her because she's not running for re-election. That's why I tell Farm Bill uh, you know, you know, watchers, don't give up. Uh, the Senate could well go first, by the way, but they again have to go through some of the appropriation bills. So um, I think she's not going to give up until the very end, Clinton. So, you know, you know, there's somebody to watch. If she were to give up on a farm bill uh, uh, into 2024, then, then that's it. The current farm bill expired on September 30th, although many of the programs with mandatory spending remain funded. Congress has until January 1st to pass a new farm bill or an extension. Otherwise, some programs revert back to policies from the 1940s. One of the first commodities to be impacted by the lack of a farm bill is the dairy industry. Tyne Morgan is at World Dairy Expo where leaders are watching the Washington situation closely. Tyne. Well, Clinton, talking to dairy leaders here at World Dairy Expo, what played out in Washington earlier this week means all bets are off for timing of passing a new farm bill. They say it's pretty much a guarantee that we won't see one in 2023. But the question is now if we have an extension and how long it will last. For dairy, an extension really isn't ideal, but it's also not worst case, as an extension would keep some of those positive safety net changes that happened in the last farm bill in place. For dairy in particular, you know, we're not in a bad position because we made huge improvements to dairy policy in the 2018 Farm Bill. We made the safety net effective, and it wasn't before that. Now we've got to maintain that program. The changes we're looking for are more kind of around the edges. We're not looking for major change in policy. We'd like to kind of update the production history of the program, make that more contemporaneous to today's milk production. Uh, some other tweaks we'd like to see made. Clinton Mulhern tells me that one of the changes that National Milk Producers Federation is pushing for is a complicated one. It's modernizing the federal milk marketing order, and it is one that USDA is currently conducting hearings on, but NMPF is also pushing for that in the new farm bill. By the way, Jim Mulhern, a staple of the dairy industry, a leader for decades, he is retiring in December. Reporting from World Dairy Expo here in Madison, Wisconsin, I'm Tyne Morgan for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Tyne. Another story we're continuing to watch sinking water levels on the Mississippi River and the impact that's having on bases up and down the major waterway. Ag Day's Michelle Rook keeping an eye on this. And Michelle, this is a big concern for farmers right now. 
That's right. Low river levels have created a real trifecta in the soybean market. It's slam basis levels increased barge freight rates and taken a real toll on soybean exports. So as a result, cash prices for soybeans are well under a year ago here at harvest time. With impaired traffic on the U.S.'s main export shipping channel, USDA is reporting soybean exports so far this marketing year totals 682 million bushels, down 32 percent from last year. And basis levels on soybeans have imploded in many areas along the river with barge restrictions and better than expected yields in some areas like Illinois. The Memphis basis for soybeans has just collapsed. I think it's a 180 under right now. And just two or three weeks ago, it was 60 under or 70 under. And, and we're sitting here with daily moves of almost 60 cents because of this <clears throat> polling of the basis. And, and just realize we're not going to get the demand. As a result, in markets farther away from the river, soybean basis levels have also weakened more than normal during harvest. That's complicating marketing decisions for farmers who had tight basis in 2022, allowing many to sell off the combine. It doesn't take a genius to know out there that basis has fallen. We're also seeing outside of uh, those areas where processors are starting to pick that up and raise their basis. But what we're noticing in the numbers is because they know that demand has fallen and capacity has fallen so much at the river, they're not spiking their bids nearly as much as they're used to. Corn exports are pacing better than soybeans and are up 9% over last year, totaling 566 million bushels for the current marketing year. Zuzalo says that's in large part due to Mexican purchases of corn, which can be moved by rail versus barge. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. Rain might slow some harvest action today in areas of the Corn Belt. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has a look ahead. Yeah, one of the things about this situation regarding rainfall and the harvest is unlike what we had on Wednesday and Thursday, which was torrential downpours uh, north to south across the United States. As we move into the weekend, it's more light to moderate showers, so more of a, a nuisance rain on the back side of this trough of low pressure. This is Friday at 5 p.m. Start to see the green and in terms of intensity, it's going to be more light to moderate showers that are going to be widely scattered. We follow the torrential rain off here onto the east coast by Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon. That's going to be approaching the east coast and I have to watch pretty closely because what you're seeing here is actually a tropical system as this trough digs to the east. Now, much like what we saw with the previous tropical system, it can potentially get wrapped back up and into the northeast uh, where it becomes more of a hybrid system, both wind and rain. Now, on the backside of this trough, you got some cool dry air coming down from the north and to the northwest. Rain chances start to come to an end Saturday uh, into our Sunday for a good portion of the plains, uh, but also uh, into uh, the Midwest as well. Again, there's Saturday at 11 a.m. with this trough starting to move out and things really drying out across the United States unless we're on the east coast back up here to the north and to the east. Big ridge of high pressure. This is Sunday at 6 a.m. Uh, with, uh, again, that ridge building back off to the west, which is going to lead to a lot warmer temperatures. Yields in the Fields on Ag Day is brought to you by Micro Essentials, the super granule that packs balanced nutrition into a single granule for uniform nutrient distribution, increased nutrient uptake, and season-long sulfur availability beating commodity fertilizers every time. Supercharge your yields with the Mighty Micro from Mosaic. Let's go take a look at what's going on in uh, Illinois and checking those yields in the fields. Today we had, uh, again, Illinois in the central part of the state. Brent sending this one in, checking out his soybean crop. He says it's actually cutting very easy, but he says yields are all over the board. Some good, some disappointing. I'll have more on your forecast in just a bit. The United Kingdom is warning Ukraine about the possibility of Russian mines in the Black Sea, and that's raising concerns for shipping in the region. It says that includes near the entrances to Ukrainian ports. Now, according to Reuters, the UK's foreign office has expressed concern Russia may opt for covert action, such as laying mines rather than openly sinking civilian vessels. And officials say Russia may even try to blame the attacks on Ukraine. In fact, there was an unconfirmed report of a ship hitting a mine in the Black Sea yesterday. Now, you'll remember earlier this week, we told you Ukraine said five ships were heading to its Black Sea ports near Odessa for loading with grain, and it says three others recently left with cargoes. Black Sea uncertainty flipping markets on Thursday. We'll get the very latest with Michelle Rook next. 
and later a dip, a scoop, a cone, all serviceable options when it comes to ice cream. We'll visit a new creamery on the University of Tennessee's campus in the country. Some solid export numbers and some help from wheat helped corn make some gains on Thursday. How could we end this week? Michelle Rook is back to discuss it in Markets Now. A higher day Thursday in the greens. Dave Chatterton with Strategic Farm Marketing is joining us. And Dave, wheat was the price leader. It looked like putting in a little more premium. Yeah, Michelle, kind of interesting day. We've been kind of lamenting, at least in our shop, kind of the lack of fresh news and a little bit of a lackluster trade here of late. But that kind of changed um, in the afternoon on Thursday or during the session Thursday, I should say, when we got reports from the, the Lloyd Shipping Group out of London that a general cargo ship had encountered a seaborne mine en route to Ukraine. Now, um, to be fair, this ship was traveling outside of the recently outlined humanitarian corridor from Ukraine. It had left from Turkey and was crossing the strait in that manner. The ship didn't sustain, you know, a lot of damage. It stopped for a while and then resumed its journey here. But certainly that was enough to get the attention of the trade on Thursday afternoon and in, in a situation where, you know, wheat is, is still near those multi-year lows. We still have a, a pretty large fund of short exposure in the corn and the wheat. We, we saw some pretty aggressive short covering. No doubt. And of course, that spilled over into the corn market, caused some short covering there perhaps, but we got above some chart resistance. So now can we keep going? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think today's action and Friday would be very key in doing that. Seasonally, this you know first half of October is prime time for carving out that seasonal harvest low and for the markets to, to get a good 30, 35, 40 cent rally in corn. So whether we can do that, I think it's still a little bit questionable. We've got a key USDA report coming up next Thursday where the focus is on, again on U.S. yield and, and on the demand components in the balance sheet. So I'm not sure that we're out of the woods yet, but certainly technically you have to let that action stand on its own today, regardless of what happens in Ukraine. And, and um, you know, the, the news there is getting a little bit more positive as we go. Yeah. What about the soybean market? We've had a pretty good correction here. You know, do you think we have more downside and did soybeans just follow corn and wheat on Thursday? Yeah, yeah, I think a little bit of a reluctant follower there, Michelle. And, you know, the, the soybean balance sheet we know is tight. We know the USD will confirm that again next week. But I think it's a question of exports. This October, November, December time period is kind of kind of go time for U.S. soybean exports. And we are really falling behind year to date export sales right now versus last year. 34 percent behind the pace we were at last year. The USDA is calling for a 10 percent year-on-year decline. So we've got some ground to make up there. And I think the market is concerned that there's just not going to be enough time nor enough water in the river to kind of close that gap before we get to January and start focusing on corn at the Gulf. That is so true. It's really been a focus. All right. Thanks for joining us, Dave Chatterton with Strategic Farm Marketing. That's Markets Now, and we'll have more ad day coming up. So a little bit ago, we looked at kind of the rainfall chances through the weekend. I want to take you from October 10th through the 14th, where that harvest continues, actually seeing a below normal conditions in terms of precipitation back up into the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, uh, with dry weather back down here to the south. Uh, the rain is really going to be locked in on the east coast with not only that trough digging to the east coast, but also that tropical system influencing the rain back up into the northeast. Again, that's like the precipitation outlook. Show you what this looks like uh, with the jet stream map. And we're going to see a big ridge develop back out to the west, which is going to allow uh, this trough just kind of settle and sit off the east coast within the jet stream for a couple of days and even into next week as it ramps itself and re reworks back around with that energy sitting in the same place starting on Sunday and then the first half of next week. But where there's a deep trough, uh, there's a high amplitude ridge. And that's what we're seeing back up into Montana uh, with some warmth and dry weather back out here to the west. Again, that's a jet stream coming up on Sunday. As we get into next week, things kind of take a bit of a turn. So long as this uh, low, this uh, cutoff low, is, uh, it will become by Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, that's going to kind of bottle everything up back out to the west and suppress the ridge down here to the south. So not a lot of extreme heat in the forecast. Even where that cold air is located, it's going to moderate over the course of about two or three days with more zonal 
a zonal pattern back down here to the south and then a little bit more activity. It is going to be a bit of a mess uh, up into the northeast in Canada with this uh, bowling ball type cutoff low in the jet stream. Well, what that looks like in terms of that drought monitor, we still need it uh, in and across the United States and we're not unfortunately in the kind of pattern that I'm seeing in the jet stream. You're going to get a lot of rain back down here into Texas or even Louisiana. Let's go take a look at uh, Blythe. Just fun to say Blythe, California, sunny, high around 102 degrees. Truth or consequences? Actually, the, the city was named uh, after that radio program back in the 1950s. Mostly sunny, high around 83 degrees and Joliet. All roads lead to Joliet. Missouri's Attorney General is urging Tyson Foods to sell two poultry processing facilities instead of closing them. Andrew Bailey penning a letter to Donnie King, the CEO of Tyson Foods. Now you'll remember Tyson announced plans in August to shut down two facilities located in Knoll and Dexter, Missouri. It's part of a broader closure plan affecting two other plants in North Little Rock, Arkansas and Cordon, Indiana. In his letter, Bailey emphasized the significance of the plants to their local communities. He cited their historical ties and the potential economic devastation that would result from them shutting down. Officials in Dexter estimate the closure would impact at least 863 jobs. Beef packers are continuing to see their margins slip. The latest Sterling Beef Profit Tracker reporting packer losses totaled $89 per head. Now that's down $23 from the previous week. Cattle feeding margins finished the week last week with average profits of $300 per head. Cash cattle prices averaged just under $184 per hundredweight, down about $1.28 from the previous week. That price 21% higher than the same time last year. Cattle sold last week carried a total feed cost of $530 per head, which is down about $34 per head from the previous week and $66 than the same time last year. And don't forget the dessert this holiday season. Up next, we're off to Tennessee, where university students are getting some hands-on experience at a new campus creamery in the country. As we celebrate dairy at World Dairy Expo this week in Tennessee, they're serving up a scoop of tradition, big orange spirit and delicious ice cream. As Charles Denny reports, the University of Tennessee has opened its new creamery with students running the business. Featuring flavors like Go Big Orange and Vanilla, customers can now enjoy a delicious ice cream cone on the UT campus. The university has opened its new creamery, but reopened would be more accurate. A taste of history is also part of this experience. The UT Creamery is a partnership between the UT Institute of Agriculture's Herbert College of Agriculture and the College of Education, Health and Human Sciences, Rocky Top Institute of Retail. Students don't just scoop and serve, but really run the place. So they have um, the retail students, which get to manage the um, business side of retail. And then we have students that we hire from all majors across the university and they really get to experience what it's like to work with the public. In addition to the flavors offered here, the creamery also serves up a scoop of nostalgia. The university had a creamery from 1915 to 1985. This is a revival of that tradition with some modern science thrown in. The old creamery was a UT fixture, producing dairy products for campus use. Old black and white photos are displayed around the new facility. Jumping now to the present, students at UT's Herbert College of Agriculture are making the product, mixing the ingredients in a lab, and later adding the flavors to creations such as smoky strawberry kisses. From there, it becomes a safe, high-quality ice cream that can be enjoyed. As right now, as we're bringing in a pasteurized mix um, in the ice cream process. And then what we do is we add it to what we call the barrel freezer. And then the barrel freezer is kind of like your homemade ice cream freezer that you would see at your house that you know, uses rock, uh, ice and rock salt. Uh, here we use a mechanical refrigeration on a much larger scale. 
Herbert student Grace Powell is one of the students who makes ice cream several days a week between classes. Yeah, it is, it is definitely one of those uh, cool moments to be sitting um, in a dining hall or in the student union or just in one of my classes and they're talking about how great the, the ice cream is at the creamery. I'm just sitting there like, I make that. Grace and other students will keep on making ice cream and the creamery will keep serving it, a popular place on campus these days. A new old venture where today's technology is bringing a storied UT tradition back. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks, Charles. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.